But in the era that this book is set, Bridge was very cool. In the late 20s and, and early 30s, Bridge was young and sexy. You know, what you need for a craze is you need a galvanizing force. And, and the P.T. Barnum of the Bridge craze was a man named E. Lee Culbertson. And you need a few flashpoint moments to drive it. And, and one of those moments is the centerpiece of this book. It, it occurred in, in Kansas City on the night of September 29th, 1929, just about three weeks before the market crashed, when two couples sat down for a social game of bridge in an in a elegant apartment. Myrtle and Jack Bennett played as partners against Charles and Mamie Hoffman, their upstairs neighbors. And remember, bridge, unlike poker, is a partnership game. And so all was going fine for the Bennetts until the midnight hour came, the cards turned against them, and then they turned against each other. Jack Bennett failed a four spades uh, contract. He didn't make it in the, in the ultimate hand, and Myrtle lit into him. You're a bum bridge player, Jack. He loved the language of, of the 1920s. And, and Jack replied that maybe I'm not the only one. And then it, the argument intensified. Now, Jack was an alpha male. He was a perfume salesman, traveling salesman. And uh, he was known to Myrtle as a philanderer. She had found a love letter from another woman in Jack's in the pocket of his trousers several years before, and there was a, a real tension in the marriage. And so Jack stands up, reaches across the table, grabs Myrtle by the wrist, and slaps her hard in the face. Myrtle begins to sob. The Hoffmans embrace Myrtle to try to comfort, console her, and Jack announces, I'm leaving, and he starts to pack his bag. Well, bad enough that he, he slaps his wife, Jack Bennett, compounds his mistake then by, by uh, asking her to go get my gun, which he carried with him on, on the road for protection. Suffice to say, I mean, bad idea. Bad idea, bad idea. And suffice to say, four bullets later, old Jack was no more. And so, remember, this is the beginning of the modern media age. You have, you know, tabloid newspapers started in New York in 1920, and you have uh, talky films and newsreels and most famously, you have radio. By 1930, 40% of American homes have a radio. So character can be shaped three-dimensionally now, and of course Roosevelt would use it to great effect in the 30s. Well, Myrtle Bennett hires the most famous man in Kansas City as her attorney, a Democratic presidential candidate, former U.S. Senator James A. Reed, Jim Reed, a brilliant orator, one of the best the Senate had known for generations. I mean, his oratory hearkened to, you know, the oratory of, of, the, of you know, Calhoun and Clay and Webster, the, the greats of the, of the Senate past. And so he walks into the courtroom and, and the jurors all but bow to the great man. This great man who smoked cigars with Clarence Darrow and H.L. Mencken represented Henry Ford and oil companies in the courtroom. And, and so now he's representing uh, a widow of a traveling perfume salesman. And, you know, the truth is, is Reed was running for president again, and he needed to, to attract more women voters who remembered that he had opposed the suffrage um, uh, amendment. He, he just felt that if women voted, that it wouldn't change the vote. It would merely double the vote, at least in his state of Missouri, because women, of course, would vote just as their husbands voted. So now he's representing this housewife who had been struck by her husband, and it's a huge sensation. It's a nationwide you know, media frenzy. And, of course, during the trial, Reed is waxing on about the sanctity of womanhood. Meanwhile, in New York, the Barnum of the Bridge craze, a Russian named Ely Culbertson, spotlessly manicured in his tuxedo, urbane, cunning, perhaps megalomaniacal, was watching what was going on in Kansas City, and he was using it to his great advantage. Culbertson, you know, loved the Bennett killing because it dramatized a game that, that pretty much lives in the mind. He made Bridge very sexy, deliberately. Yeah, he did. And what he was doing was marketing to housewives. And remember, as part of this new media age, advertising is booming. And Culbertson befriended you know, um, the leaders in advertising in the media in New York and used those friendships to serve his own purposes. And of course, in 1931, in December, the same year as the Bennett trial, Ely Culbertson and his wife Josephine, they were bridge champions, played in this ballyhooed match called the Bridge Battle of the Century. 
It was played first in, in, at the Chatham Hotel in New York, where the Culbertsons lived in a huge suite, uh, and then moved to the Waldorf Astoria, a very elegant hotel. And, and um, it was Ely and Joe playing the Culbertson system against two men, Sidney Lenz and Oswald Jacoby. They were playing what was then called the official system of bridge. And really what was at stake was the spoils of this growing cottage industry of bridge. It was booming. And I won't spoil the book, I don't think, by telling you the Culbertsons did win that, that battle. But, and it was a tipping point of the bridge craze. I mean, from that point, you know, all bets were off. This was a full-fledged craze. Fun book. Well done. I, 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 honestly, if someone said, read a book on bridge, or you can jump off a bridge, there'd be a splash. But uh, this is very entertaining. And, it, and I felt like it was, I think like it was in the 20s. It was great. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a fun book to research, a fun book to write, and it should be a fun book to read. And if it's not, I've really messed it up because I, I just think it, it's a riveting story. You have succeeded in spades, sir. The book is The Devil's Tickets, A Night of Bridge, A Fatal Hand, and A New American Age. I've been speaking with the author Gary M. Pomerantz and The Devil's Tickets, published by Crown, distributed in Canada by Random House.